middle point. It's that marvelous combination of stitches on canvas, both cruel and needlepoint combined, which make a most lovely velvety tapestried effect. The smooth background worked in tent stitch, and then the raised texture of the cruel stitches superimposed on it really give it such a nice rich effect and really it's such fun to do. This is Hunkamunka, one of Beatrix Potter's characters and one of my favorites. She stole into the doll's house, you know, and insisted on putting her babies into the doll's cradle. But here's a complete contrast. This little bag was done in quite fine cotton on very fine canvas, and I felt it would look awfully flat if it was done all in the regular tent stitch of needlepoint. So I did the background in bargello or brick stitch, and then added a few little frostings on the cake, such as French knots, padded satin stitch, and outlined some of the shapes with stem stitch. You see, padded satin stitch gives so much more intense color than the regular needlepoint stitch. The reds of these flowers stand out brilliantly, and so they become the focal point of the design. But you can do all kinds of things. Here's a pillow, which is rather a tapestried look. It's done with fishbone stitch and French knots on stalks. And that's my favorite French knots on stalks. They're so lovely and raised looking. And then here's this very flat, smooth needlepoint stitch, which is called encroaching gobelin, because it looks just like a tapestry. Here's a tennis racket cover, which is done in needlepoint. The initial is just regular tent stitch. And then I intertwined it with my birthday flowers, which happened to be asters, and worked those in cruel stitches on top of the brick stitch or bargello background. Or how about a dog collar for the best dressed four-footed friend? <laughs> this is done with regular needlepoint canvas background and the flowers in a raised stitch so that they really are in relief on top. Really a very handsome animal would be wearing that. But if you want to start out to do hunkamunka, for instance, the first thing you have to do is to outline your design on the needlepoint canvas with a permanent marker. Make it permanent so that it doesn't run and then Really, you should start off by doing your background stitches right up against the design. In this case, it doesn't matter because I'm working this basket inside the rocker, and so it won't come against the background. And I chose a weaving stitch for this because it does give you the effect of a basket. Just come up and go right down at the other end with a great huge stitch, then come up one thread away so that there's a gap between the stitches and make long vertical stitches like that across the whole shape. I used an antique gold, rather a dark color, and now I'm taking a lighter color and a huge blunt needle and I'm going to weave under and over those threads. just under and over like that, all the way across. It's just like sock darning, which everybody has forgotten nowadays because we always throw the socks away instead of mending them. <laughs> Separate your threads so that they lie nice and flat. Go down and come up one thread away. And go back again in exactly the same place as you were before going under and over the same threads so that the light gold will lie side by side. That'll give you a double line of stitching, which is what you want to give the wide effect of the basket wicker work. Now the next row comes alternately 
and you push your needle under and over the threads which were on top. I mean, pick up this thread which was underneath before and go over the thread that's on top. Just like regular weaving. Go down and then come back again. Oh, I nearly made a mistake and started weaving. But the second row must go back the same way as the first row, as the row you just did, so that you have a nice double line of stitching. Then your third row is going to pick up the same threads as the first, over and under. And as you put the needle in, push the needle up so that you pack the threads closely together, because they are apt to get a little bit droopy in the middle. You can choose all kinds of stitches, especially for Hanka Manka's clothes. You can really go to town with all kinds of patterns. You have the canvas as a background, so you can count and make geometric patterns. Here's one that's really lovely. It's a basis of tent stitch, which is the regular needle point stitch. Come up, count one down and one back, and make a little slanting stitch which lies over the intersection of each of the mesh of the canvas, always slanting from right to left, always slanting the same way. Working it like this on the frame means that you can stab it up and down and get a beautifully smooth tent stitch because your tension can be so even. Besides, I'm going to be counting the stitches. You see, I want to make a network of squares, five stitches apart. One, two, three, four, five. Once you've made a horizontal line, come down and make a vertical one. So each of the little squares of tent stitch is going to be five stitches wide. Make that outline or skeleton first, and then with a contrasting color, in this case I'm using a lighter yellow, fill in between with slanting satin stitches starting across the middle of the square and then putting two smaller stitches on either side. Isn't that rather a nice effect? It could be an awfully attractive stitch used in the background of a piece of needlepoint. In that case, you could use the same color for your tent stitch and for your filling in. But the contrast in her skirt will look rather prettier, I think, like a printed or a patchwork. Well, when you've finished the skirt, then you can jump to something else that fascinates you. How about the baby's dress? I thought white angora would be suitable, so I'm using three threads, and I'm going to do it in chain stitch. Now, this is a true, cruel stitch, and I'm going to be treating the needlepoint canvas just as though it was regular embroidery linen. Come up, go down in the same hole, and come up inside the loop and draw it flat. Leave your chain stitches fairly loose because then the fluff of the angora will show. Go down into the hole where your thread comes up, right inside the loop. Hold the loop and come up inside it. And you see, you follow the outline of the dress quite smoothly and it's just like drawing the design or working as though you had a piece of embroidery linen. Don't bother to count the threads and don't worry about what's going on on the canvas underneath. When you get to the end of the row, go outside your loop to fasten it and start again up at the top. You can afford to jump that little distance underneath because the stitches will cover it as you work down again. 
you jump up to the top so that you can get each row running from top to bottom. Chain stitch looks much smoother that way than if you worked up and down. Follow the line of the first row of stitching and then you'll finally fill in the whole dress with line after line of that. Now, here by magic is Hunker Munker worked a little more. And you can see how the basket looks when it's finally finished. And then here are the little babies and Hunker Munker's face, which is worked in long and short stitch, the stitch that's used so much in cruel embroidery, again treating the canvas just as though it was fabric. You can get quite a lot of shading and furry looking stitches. And then here's her dress, the little baby. You note that she's sucking her thumb, by the way. And the paws of the mouse that's holding, uh, Hunker Munker's paws, are worked right on top. Sometimes when you get the stitches to join one another, they leave little spaces of canvas, which isn't very pretty. So I'm going to outline her apron with buttonhole stitch so that the little unattractive seam down here is covered. Go down on the inside of the shape, hold the loop, and come up on the outside. Quite big stitches work right over the brick stitch, which was worked for her apron. Just follow along like that. Of course, one of the most fascinating stitches is this turkey work that I used on the coverlet. And I just took three shades of pink and threaded them into the needle at the same time to make it look a little variegated. Go down and make a loop, and then come up and make a little stitch across in the front to fasten that loop firmly. It's sort of the principle of a hooked rug. What you're doing is making a series of loops and tacking it down very firmly with a little stitch in the front. As long as you understand the principle of it, you'll be able to remember it easily. Make a little loop and then come back to the last stitch, pull it through and fasten it tightly. Work the stitch row after row so that it forms a curved line following the outline of the whole quilt. It's certainly a warm coverlet to tuck the babies up in. Here's a final tie-down stitch. When you get to the end of the row, you can just cut your thread off and start again at the other end. When you end off, though, just take a couple of little back stitches which will be hidden in the embroidery. Well, you can see how many stitches you can have. Just go on to your heart's content. And you can see how the worlds of cruel and needlepoint finally can meet with exciting results, I think. See you soon.